Hi, welcome back to my channel, Richard Tang, CEO of Zen Internet, doing another dive into the exciting world of full fiber alt-nets. And with me here today is Andy Connie Beer, CEO of Truly. Andy, a very warm welcome to Zen RHQ in Rochdale. Richard, it's a pleasure to be here. And actually, this is more than just an interview. This is an announcement of a wholesale partnership between Zen and Truly. So Andy, fantastic <laughs> to be partners. Oh, Richard, I couldn't be more delighted. Uh, this is you know, the culmination of a journey we started a good 12 months ago. Uh, we put a lot of time, a lot of money into getting here and to have got over the line now, I just couldn't be more delighted as part of the journey we're on. Yeah, me too. And look, benefits for Zen. This is our third infrastructure partner alongside OpenReach and City Fibre. Gives us now access to your whole full fibre footprint. Um, very much more limited competition, so really excited about that. And look, working with you guys over the last 12 months has been fantastic. So I do want to do a big shout out to the whole team at Truly. A particular thanks to Rhiannon O'Neill, your wholesale director, who has been brilliant. Rhiannon, absolutely awesome. Um, I, I guess from Truly's point of view, what does the Zen partnership mean to you? It's really important. As I say, we set out a good 12 months ago, uh, recognising that this was key to us. It's certainly part of our strategy to expand into wholesale partners which maybe we'll talk about later but you can never say never you're never quite sure you're going to get it over the line uh, I think that this is part of a tipping point in the industry as well and I think great things are going to change off the back of this so for me like all journeys you're on you know you get to these stages so what we're expecting is we're expecting more penetration on a network obviously, um, and that's key. We're expecting to do all the other things that you would expect as we continue down the wholesale journey, which I'm sure we'll talk about more. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's find out a bit more about Truly. Give us some background. What's Truly all about? Where does it start? Sure. Uh, well, a bit of history is um, I've been in the telecoms industry since I was 16, and uh, I joined BT as an apprentice and did an apprenticeship and uh, and I actually spent 18 years at BT, and um, most of those years I stayed in what would now be called OpenReach, didn't exist at the time, uh, because I've always been fascinated in building networks. I love building networks and everything that goes around that. So, uh, but after 18 years, I figured it was time to sort of stretch out on my own and set up a company, which uh, I did in 2002. Uh, we were originally called CoolFlow at the time. And we've gone through a number of steps. We did various things, but in classic, I guess, gamekeeper turned poacher, mm -hmm. now I was outside of uh, BT, I was always looking for opportunities to use my skills. Uh, I guess the notable things um, that we've done is we started as a sideline. We were a wireless internet service provider, a WISP. Why did we do that? That was in the day of ADSL, uh, half a meg to two meg. I'm sure you remember that. I know you I remember it. I do. Um, and the reason we got into being a very niche WISP was that at the time, BT were saying that they might cover 50 or 60% of the UK, um, which left a lot of people worried that they weren't going to be able to get this new fangled broadband. So uh, we did some uh, wireless internet to fill some of that gap. Uh, building off of that experience that we then moved into FTTC uh, VDSL and uh, you know why did we move into FTTC well again uh, I think um, BT were saying at the time that people generally didn't need more than 15 megabits per second uh, and we felt they did um, and it was a regulated product so that was perfect and it was at that time that uh, I got a phone call one day from BT uh, uh, basically, they said that they had to launch this product called PIA, sharing their ducks and poles, passive infrastructure access. And uh, would I help and participate in the proof of concept that they were doing with Fujitsu and Sky to help develop the product? Of course. I mean, pigs in muck spring to mind, really, at the end of the day. It was a, it was a marriage made in heaven. So we helped uh, BT develop that. Um, Fujitsu and Sky didn't take that forward. And for a number of years, uh, CoolFlow, as we were then, were the only consumers of PIA. Uh, and we developed lots of things and really started to think about how we could build fibre networks because 
there just was no uh, Bible or roadmap on what uh, fibre consumer networks should look like. Uh, and that led us then to the inevitable journey of full fibre to the home. Uh, when we decided, okay, how are we going to do this? And we were the first company also to launch XGS Bond. We partnered with Adtran. I think they had some little bits in Australia. Uh, we knew it was cutting edge, bleeding edge, really. Uh, and, um, and that's worked really well for us as well with XGS Pond. So that's a potted history of, uh, of Truly. Um, and we, we changed our name from Coolflow to Truly to differentiate our Wisp and, and Copper products that we had against our fibre products. So you were very involved in the creation of PIA, and of course PIA absolutely a key element of this alt-net explosion that we've seen in recent years. There's something in the press very recently um, about a PIA coalition that is challenging open reach on PIA cost, um, and uh, they're saying that um, the the, the, the uh, Altnets pay significantly more to access ducts and poles than OpenReach charges itself. So I, I guess it, it'd be interested to get any comment that you have on that. But also, I guess as a heavy user of PIA yourself and someone involved in creating the product in the first place, what's your view on PIA? I mean, is it fit for purpose? Is it problematic? Look, PIA has come a long way. Uh, when I go back to those original uh, proof of concept days with Fujitsu and Sky, it certainly was not fit for purpose at scale. Uh, I mean, there are so many stories I could tell you. We used to have to print out all the duct plans and stick the bits of paper together. We could, we'd roll it up, a very long toilet roll, if we were doing a, a long duct run. And that was how we built our networks and reserved it and so on. Um, and, you know, Look, you'd expect OpenReach not to be the most forthcoming with that, yeah? Why would they welcome competitors uh, onto their network? So it has been a long and hard journey. Uh, I've been very much involved in that, you know, talking about the bits that I felt were anti-competitive. And over the years, things have changed immeasurably. Uh, you know, the systems and the processes these days are so much better um, and you know even there's a there's a new proof of concept starting now in terms of clearing duct blockages which again shows the journey that uh, the industry and open reach are on to improve it as a product but to answer your question um, when i look at where it came from uh, with a massive price reduction along the way um, uh, instigated by ofcom where the prices were reduced by around 50 percent in one fell swoop to where it is now I would say, maybe controversially, we're now tinkering around the edges. I think PIA pretty much is fit for purpose. I think there are a few other bits that need work now, working on electricity poles, joint user poles, which we do, which is nothing to do with open reach. Um, and again, I'd like to think we're industry leaders on that. So as, as part of the coalition, it's not something I've been involved in because in terms of the 80-20 rule for me personally, uh, I think that I can get more value doing other things than actually looking at uh, what this coalition is trying to achieve. But obviously, I wish them the best of luck. Yeah, okay. And... Um, Let's talk about another controversial subject sparked by Jeremy Shillow on one of my interviews. BD UK is a waste of taxpayers' money, he said, and um, other people have said it's a very good use of taxpayers' money. The audience of Lynx said it is a good idea but done badly. What's your take on BD UK? Good use of taxpayers' money, waste? Look. To, if you're going to assess BDUK, I think you have to go back in history, okay? We could look at them right now and maybe in the last six months or 12 months, but let's just quickly go back in history, if I may. Yeah. Um, my recollection, hopefully reasonably accurate, uh, was that, um, as I mentioned earlier about uh, BT said that nobody needed more than 15 megabits per second, which was pretty much around ADSL averages thereabouts, um, and that if they built FTTC, that there would only be in the region of 20% take up. Now, my recollection is BDUK were formed around that time because the UK government needed faster broadband. They needed to compete with Europe and the world. And that BDUK did a pretty good job of actually engaging with BT and subsidising, essentially, BT to do widespread FTTC in the UK. Now, sure, that did mean that uh, I, I believe BT got in the order of £2 billion of subsidy to do that, taxpayers' money. Um, but on the bright side is that uh, BT's 
projections on take up were vastly exceeded, I think peaking eventually around the 70, maybe even 80% mark, uh, which meant that a big chunk, if not most of that two billion pound or circa two billion pound was paid back. So there's a, a big plus for BDUK number one. Then we look at it and say, well, what happened after that? Um, and I think what happened after that was BT and, and uh, Virgin. Uh, in essence, as a duopoly, as all duopolies, uh, they were looking to sweat their assets and uh, sweating their assets were copper. So BT were looking at GFAST um, and uh, Virgin were looking at uh, the next version of DOCSIS. But it was pretty much in lockstep as to what they were doing and pretty small steps, I guess. And that's where BDUK came back into their own again. They stimulated um, very much the alternate industry, I would say, to a degree. They did a lot of proof of concepts, which we took advantage of. Um, I remember dancing around the room one day when I got my first £1.3 million contract from BDUK to go and build some proof of concept hybrid networks, which is a combination of uh, wireless, uh, FTTC, and full fibre. Um, and, you know, BDUK did that, and they stimulated a lot of the altnets, and look where that's got us to. Mm. I guess, in hindsight, then we look at, you know, what, what was the learning out of this? And I, I think the learning was very clear to both the government and to Ofcom, is that left alone, uh, the duopoly of BT and Virgin weren't going to really innovate, as duopolies tend not to. Uh, and I think it was at that time that the decision was made very clearly that um, uh, infrastructure competition was the way forward. Uh, and of course, everything was then put in, in place with PIA improving significantly to make infrastructure competition happen. So up to that point, I would say fantastic value for money. I then think that everybody knew eventually there's going to be this last 5% or whatever it is. So BDUK would uh, have a use again at some stage in the future once the gap was known. Um, but that meant there was some time between then and now. So BDUK have been filling in that time because why would you disband a very good team? Um, and I, I particularly like Matt Ager. I think he's done great stuff at BDUK. Um, why would you disband it and knowing that it's going to come into its own? So they've done some stuff. Yeah, sure, they've, they've let some contracts where commercial builds have gone. And black and white, you would say that it was a waste of uh, taxpayers' money. But taken in the round... I would say no, and I would then say, looking forward, BDUK is about to really come back into its own, assuming the balance of the £5 billion is still there. I think tackling the gap as it becomes more apparent is going to be key. I think with a number of altnets and operators out there, um, that that should make their life easier, and I think that will enable us to get uh, fibre far, far further than we ever would have if we'd stayed in those good old duopoly days that really existed a bit too long yeah i totally agree with that uh, it's definitely stimulated um both bt and vmo2 to um to up the ante in terms of their build ambitions um for sure on, on the subject of BDUK, what is your view on the outlook for those rural broadband providers that bases that effectively base their business on BDUK bids and, and also from a truly perspective are you in rural? I mean, is your is it a rural build? Is it a sort of more metropolitan build that you've done? Yeah, well, we, we certainly are on the edge of rural. Where um, our UPRNs, our premises we pass, classify as urban, tend to be on the outskirts of the uh, towns where... Okay. Uh, nobody else had gone. We've always had a first mover advantage. That's been our, uh, our, our approach. So we would build where there's no other gigabit. Um, very much we've tried to go rural uh, and to try and second guess, because this has always been a guessing game as to where anywhere anyone else is going to go. I think in hindsight, we've guessed pretty well, yeah, because uh, the, the majority of our network is still the only gigabit play in town, um, which I know is good for both of us. So Yes, we're definitely in rural. Um, and if we look at the ultra rurals, the barns of the world, I think it's going to be a mixed bag in the future. I think it's going to be a mixed bag for all uh, alt-nets, but if we look at these particularly, I think some will be so niche and so small that um, they will get consolidated reasonably early in the consolidation play. Um, but I think some will stand alone. I think they'll stand at the test of the time. They will be the local corner butcher shop that has got a differentiation that they will have built up enough of a brand awareness in the areas that they operate in. They will have built up enough penetration in the areas that will 
equally dissuade uh, other people from coming in, not least the cost of build to come in. You know, imagine a scenario where, you know, a barn has got, I don't know, let's say 60, 70 percent take up of fibre, you know, and it costs somebody else 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 pounds to come in. You know, uh, would they come in? It'd be a nice business. Yeah, it would be a nice, I don't want to say cottage industry, but it would be a nice, you know, corner butcher shop uh, industry and their investors, if indeed they have investors, um, will say, well, look, I'm quite happy with this. Indeed, I, I don't think barn, their constitution or whatever it's called, doesn't even allow them to be sold. So, uh, so some will stay and some will go. Okay. Uh, and that leads into, I suppose, a discussion about the Truly Network uh, in terms of where have you built geographically? Where are you up to with, with the build number of premises past? How many customers have you got? What's your build ambition? You know, in the end goal, a few questions in there. Yeah, yeah. So, look, we we certainly we're, we're building. That's good. I think one of the things also we've um, uh, we've consolidated with uh, our owners. They had another investment in Scotland, uh, Axion UK. So we're now in Scotland as well. So I think that spreads three counties in Scotland. Um, in terms of uh, truly before we consolidated is we're, we're sort of like we've grown out of the southeast because that's where we're based. So we've grown out and we would now say we extend from the southeast to East Anglia to South Central and even parts of the southwest. So we're sort of at two extremes of the country, really. So up in Scotland and, and around the southeast. Um, in terms of our footprint, so we're currently just north of 370,000 homes passed, homing in quite quickly on 400,000. We've got a clearly defined runway to uh, half a million homes passed. Beyond that, um, look, we have ambitions to continue building, um, but we view this as being commercially sensitive information because this, this space is in for some changes, not least the consolidation. So we don't publish uh, widely our build plans or indeed our customer numbers. So, uh, but I'm happy to talk generally around where we sit within the industry. Yeah. Of course, your customer numbers are going to shoot up now. Zen's on board because people can buy Zen broadband delivered through your network as soon as we finish the integration, um, um, which we're well on with. Actually, we've connected the networks together already. We're well on with the API inter yeah. integration. So, looking forward to that. It's super exciting, right? But it, I mean, and we are expecting uh, customer numbers to shoot up with this partnership, and I believe others that will be in the pipeline. I think I mentioned earlier on, I think we're at a tipping point here. So why? Let's just explore a few numbers as to why I think we're at a tipping point in the UK, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. So if you look at uh, the recent point topic uh, report, so if I've got my numbers and interpreted them correctly, is in the UK, we're close to 13 million um, altnet premises pass mm -hmm. with 2 million uh, homes connected. If we strip out city fibre because they are a wholesale player, so strip out their 400,000 uh, customers they've got. That's 1.6 million customers right now, generally with an altnet, you know? mm -hmm. so not with one of the national ISPs like Zen. Mm -hmm. Then we look at you know, what is the mood music and where things go in. I think uh, BT last year, they churned just shy of half a million broadband customers. In quarter two this year, they churned 200,000. So straight lining that run rate out would say they're going to churn at least 800,000 this year on a like for like basis. I think it'll be bigger because this is a ramp up. Um, so if you take the 1.6 million uh, that have already churned to mainly um, alternates other than City Fiber and add let's say 800,000 is their share and City Fiber is another 200. This is without national ISPs. You know, fast forward this time next year, as things stand, Altnets are going to have in the order of two and a half million customers. Mm -hmm. Now, for the national ISPs, including yourself, Richard, then, is that's got to hurt, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think we're at this point now where it does hurt, uh, that the national ISPs clearly are feeling that pain. They didn't perhaps feel it. And, uh, you know, then I think Zen coming on board is just the start. I think this is a big play now that we're going to see the uh, national um, ISPs coming on board with the larger alternate networks, uh, which is going to mean that the take-up is going to be even higher than the two and a half million I've said. Mm -hmm. And that then leads to some really interesting dynamics. I mean, if you imagine a world where the likes of yourself, Vodafone, TalkTalk, Talk, let's say Sky even, uh, are on that 
13 million uh, homes passed. And uh, you say, well, okay, what is OpenReach's commercial reason to continue building beyond a certain tipping point? So it gets pretty difficult, right? As in, you know, I'm hoping and I expect that the alt nets will make uh, commercially very favorable for uh, the national ISPs to put their business with them rather than with OpenReach. So if that's the case, and let's fast forward, let's say to 2026, uh, where OpenReach are planning to build, they would be building largely uh, in areas, assuming there are alt nets there, um, for just BT stroke EE. You know, that's one heck of a business case to potentially have lost I don't know, I guess somewhere in the region of 60% of your customer base um, backing up your business case. So, so I think get to 2026, thereabouts, I actually think, um, unlike what is publicly said, I think uh, BT, OpenReach, that BTE will start to partner with Altnets as well. But let's wait and ah, see. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, you're not the first person that said that. I've got in my mind it, it, this iron door that is impenetrable for BT that we will never partner with an alt but you're the second person that said no maybe maybe the finance people in BT group will get to the point where actually what makes financial sense is not to build our own network here but to use the network that's already there so really interesting to see um, to see what pans out and uh, about that and uh, on your network, the question of B2C versus B2B, what's your view of the, the relative opportunity of, of those? Sure, look, most of our network, again, being fairly rural in, or the bias towards rural, it is largely B2C. Um, but, you know, what is the definition of B2C to B2B these days? Uh, so, yes, we've gone out and we've passed, you know, in terms of the standard classifications, uh, the vast majority of our network would be C, yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you come to B, it's like, well, what is the differentiation? You know, what is it that businesses want? And I think that's where Zen really uh, do really well to talk about quality of service and so on and to attract people. So to my mind, it's, you know, what is the, the difference? Traditionally, we're more C than B. Um, and uh, that's, that's where our network is. But I'm sure you'll look at it and see opportunities there and you know, maybe where truly our retail uh, arm haven't seen the B opportunities or enterprise opportunities, I think that uh, Zen certainly will. Yeah, and look, we, we were quite surprised because we got your UPRN list of the 370,000 properties that you passed. We, we, we ran that, uh, correlated that against our entire customer, customer base, expecting to find almost all of them in the consumer division. And actually in our small business division, in our partner division and even in our enterprise division, we were providing B2B services, including SD, you know, part of bigger SD1s. So there is opportunity in there. And actually we were pretty excited about that because it means all across all our divisions, our truly partnership's gonna be a benefit, um, which is great. And I know we're the first um, national scale ISP to partner with Truly. So what would be your message to Vodafone, Talk, Talk, Sky, and the other ISPs that might be watching this and thinking, maybe I should partner with Truly, maybe I should interconnect. Uh, well, the message is, as I said, we've spent a Come year... down, I suppose. Yeah, it is, it really is. <laughs> the price is right. Um, and uh, we've, as I said, spent a, a year and a lot of time and a lot of money uh, getting us to stage. So we've tried to make interfacing with us as easy as possible. We've got three key uh, methods to interface. So uh, one is by a service provider portal. Maybe that suits um, smaller providers. It certainly is a good way to get going while we're doing any other integration. I'm hoping we, we'll be able to use that as an enabler. Uh, the next one is direct API integration. Um, and you know, in terms of APIs and standardization, you know, we followed all the standards, so that is the next way forward. And last but not least, we've also covered off the base with uh, recently in the press, uh, Fiber Cafe, strategic imperatives. So to all of those uh, potential partners, which we do want, you know, we most certainly do want them, is we're here to make your, their lives easy um, to join our network. Yeah, we've got three different interfaces. We also have um, a great deal of experience. As I said, I'm XBT, X Network. Um, what you might not know is Rhiannon's XBT as well, used to work for me in BT. Uh, Brian O'Neill, my uh, head of ops and my ops director, he's XBT. We've worked together so many times. Mm. And what we know is that um, our, our prospective partners, that um, you know, largely speaking, for good or bad, 
they would like us to look and feel in terms of interfacing much the same as OpenReach, right? That's key, right? Because that's what people are used to. They do like the same processes, the same KPIs and all of that stuff. So we make sure that we deliver at least as good um, service as uh, BT, Shrek OpenReach. Um, so look, the message is clear. I think we're past the tipping point. I think in the absence of um, ISPs joining, they're going to continue to lose customers to the uh, vertically integrated alt-nets. Uh, and you know, I think it's a win-win now. And so we would welcome everyone with open arms. And you know, hopefully, we'll have further announcements in uh, in the future on that basis as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And look, I think there's a fourth opportunity as well, um, which is we have a partner channel with 800 and odd channel partners. So as and when we've done the work in our channel API and portal our partner network will be able to order on the Truly network uh, indirectly through Zen. So th four different options actually to get an access into your network, um, which is great. Let's talk about the big consolidation. You touched on it earlier. Um, very hot topic in the industry. People liken to this complex chess game. Where it's, where's it going to end up? Where do you think Truly will fit into the big consolidation and when? Wow, now look, my crystal ball has already failed on this one. Um, okay. I thought the big consolidation was going to start last year. It hasn't. Then I thought it would start this year, and we're now in August. Mm. Um, there's been some trickles uh, and things that have happened, but certainly no tsunami. And I think it's probably important to understand why, or certainly why I think that it hasn't happened yet. And uh, to me, this is, you know, this is all about efficient operators so um, certainly I know with my background I know with Jeremy who visited me a long time ago between community fiber and setting up Netomnia yeah, okay. and uh, and um, I opened up to Jeremy and uh, I think you know I, I believe that uh, it's fair to say he took great inspiration from what we do and and you know efficient operators are building at really efficient rates so let's pick and put a number on it in the order of 200 pounds per premise pass oh wow that is low yeah. Inefficient operators, um, and perhaps this is people with less experience, you know, have, have built not uncommon to see numbers of a thousand pounds per premise pass. Mm -hmm. So you look at this and say, um, and trust me, I, I, where I'm going with this question, it, if you look at it and say, if you take those two and do just a very simple example, an efficient operator, 10 premises, 2,000 pounds, an inefficient operator, two premises pass, 2,000 pounds. So an efficient operator, you know, at the end of the day, they would have, let's say, one customer, um, and that would be 10% take up. Inefficient would be one customer, 50% take up. So, so you start to look at some of these things and go, wow, you've got lots of alt nets with lots of different build costs going on out there. Mm -hmm. And you know, investors are not in the habit of crystallizing losses. And that, to me, is what's happening here, is right now in the market, a lot of people have spent a lot of money building relatively expensive uh, networks. The sort of people that would buy them um, will tend to say, well, why would I want to buy you at £1,000 per premise past when I can build it for 200 or thereabouts? And there are reasons, one for the customer base and two for you know, shortening the timelines for sure. Uh, but that does mean that uh, a lot of people, investors are sitting there saying, look, I don't want to take a haircut. So they are just... Um, drip feeding in enough money to keep their their alt nets going. Uh, why are they doing that? They're hoping that things will improve, that times will get better. I liken this to um, negative equity, and I know now I know you're the same age as me. Um, I know that uh, we remember when we were young, there was a big neg negative equity it period. Was. I had a friend of mine who bought a flat and lost a load of money, uh, and what did he do? He sat tight. Yeah, mm. he sat tight, as did lots of people, and it was only the people that were really desperate that needed for whatever reason to get out that got out. So I think that um, a lot of the alt-nets and their backers are sitting tight right now. They're looking at the ramp up in customer take-up numbers, I, I've said, which is going you know, 1.6 million, 2.5 million without wholesale partners. And they're saying, well, okay, when can I break even? When can I get to a stage that um, I might better wash my face and get back my investment? Because as I say, Crystallizing a, crystallizing a loss is severely career limiting. Yeah, uh, so so I think there's going to be three things that are going to happen. Perhaps more slowly than what we think is there's going to be there will be some insolvencies. Okay, 
because I think some of the networks are very small, they're losing lots of money, and they won't be attractive to anybody. I think they'll be in the minority. Then I think there'll be what I call bad consolidation, but what, what do I mean by bad consolidation? These were the people who've built networks that are reasonably inefficient, have cost quite a bit of money, um, but they recognise they need scale to keep going. And so you will get smaller operators consolidating on shares. So it just be a share swap, share merge, um, because that doesn't crystallize a loss. Mm -hmm. So I think you'll see some of those smaller operators trying to beef up like that just to buy themselves time to perhaps get them down the route of getting wholesale partners on board. And then you'll get good consolidation. Um, and good consolidation is the efficient operators, the larger ones, uh, being able to work out a deal which works for everybody. But I think that's going to be shaped by, you know, a deal that works for everybody is going to be equally shaped by what happens now with national ISPs such as Zen getting on board with uh, the Altnets. Mm -hmm. Is the more uh, national ISPs do get on board with the Altnets, the less the driver to consolidate. That's interesting. Yeah. So. I still believe that you know we will end up with a third national-ish uh, network. Whether it'll all be under one roof is questionable. I think, yes, I can see that we will get to the five to six um, alt-nets that broadly predicted, but I think it could take longer. Uh, I think, you know, we talked about 2030, and I think it could easily be 2030 before we get there. So from... Our perspective, you know, where do we think we sit in with this? Um, our owners now, the Bonn Infrastructure uh, Partners, you know, they're massive, yeah? 8 billion euros under investment, you know, 70 investments in Europe, particularly France and Spain. They've got uh, well over 10 million homes passed with fibre. Their investments are typically on a 15 to 25 year uh, time horizon. These are long-term investors with deep pockets. So we're staying around, yeah? Um, good. <laughs> yeah, it's a win-win. Glad um, to hear that. Yeah. So we're we're staying around, but uh, and and I think you know, in terms of that consolidation play, look, we will look at it opportunistically. Yeah, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, we'll see where the value for money uh, lands and so on. And I think we'll be quite keen to be part of it. But it's so difficult to predict at this point in time. Making any predictions is is very very difficult. Great. Well, great insight there. Um, you touched on the build cost and the differences in build, build cost of, of, of perhaps fivefold um, per premise passed. And I, I guess that leads to the whole question of what market penetration does an alt-net need to break even? What market penetration does an alt-net need to, um, to actually return to their investors what was expected in the plan? Um, and Jeremy's set the lowest bar with 13% for a break-even. That's just for break-even. Mm -hmm. Typically, alt-nets are saying, you know, we are planning on between 30 and 40% market penetration. Some are saying high 20s. So from Truly's point of view, given your build cost profile, where do you need to get to roundabouts to break-even? Where do you need to get to roundabouts to return what your business plan says yeah so i think if we take jeremy and efficient operators and start from that basis uh, hopefully the the rough worked example i gave shows that you know if you if you built a thousand pounds versus 200 maybe with debt maybe without um is it, your break-even point is dramatically different yeah so i gave an example of 10 percent take up under 200 pounds per premise pass equating to 50 percent take up Simple maths yeah. um, uh, for somebody that's built at a thousand pounds per premise pass. So, look, we're at the bottom end of that scale. Yeah, we're in the, we're in the ballpark where Jeremy's saying because we're building at that same sort of uh, place. But you can see why other operators are saying they need 30, 40, 50 percent to break even. It's down to their cost of build. Yeah, um, and I could talk about cost of builds and why it's so different. Uh, but so if you take the cost of build is 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 key. You are going to get different um, outcomes at the end of the day, and um, you know I think that uh, we'll, we're going to wait and see how this plays out in terms of you know our aspiration. Our aspiration is clear. We want as many customers on a network as possible. We want a low break even so that you know we break even you know at a very low level, and then we want as much upside as possible. Who doesn't? Yeah. Yeah, 
absolutely. But but going back to my other an answer is, you know, where are we in the UK right now? Is the average of the 16 biggest alternates is 15% take up. Mm. I've done some fag packet mass that says without um, uh, without uh, wholesale partnerships, that's going to get up in the region of 20 to 30% in the next 12 months mm -hmm. you know with wholesale partnerships it's going to get higher with wholesale partnerships people like zen are going to say it's cheaper for me to connect with uh, truly than it is with open reach so you know you know in, in essence you could say that you could foresee going beyond 50 percent um reasonably quite easy part of customers being sticky is it will depend to a degree on how much open reach have already got through their partners because you know, churning between um, uh, fibre networks is, you know, it's not tricky, it's, it's okay, but who really wants to do it? So sticky customers on a sticky network. So I think there's a real timing issue here as to how, how fast uh, alternates need to go or can go to get customers onto their networks uh, via partners who then become very sticky. Yeah. What about overbuild? What's your view on overbuild? And I guess from a truly perspective and an industry perspective... Yeah, I think again, I, I tend to take things back. How in. much of your network is overbuilt? Can you share that? Yeah, well, I think I said earlier. You know, the majority of our network is not overbuilt. We are the only gigabit play in town. Fantastic. Win win. We you know we 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 sort of took a leap of faith. I think the background was very much fud, right? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt spread by everyone, not just open reach, is who's going to build where. So why, what were the dynamics there? Uh, the dynamics were pretty much that uh, everybody was getting money. Money was coming into the industry like no tomorrow. Um, and uh, so everybody wanted to reserve their footprint. Yeah, they, they had money to build to a million homes or whatever the number was. And their investors would reasonably say, well, which million homes are you going to build to? So everybody was trying to plan to flag um, and say, well, I'm building here. And of course, it was a game of bluff and double bluff. So nobody really knew where anyone was going to build. A um, couple of lovely anecdotes. There's one company uh, who, to try and place their flag, they went out and they put plastic, um, plastic boxes, fibre boxes, with nothing in them, at the top of lots of poles. Yeah? And it had their logo on there. And they weren't connected to anything. They were just there with their logo. And it was like, don't come here because we're already here. Um, other examples were uh, very similar, brackets, which was just a bracket that would support one of those plastic ones. Uh, and another one was companies that would submit highways works to make it look like they were going into an area, um, but they were just doing it as a defensive play. So overbuild happened because of this massive game of bluff and double bluff, yeah? It's not good looking forward because where somebody, where alternates are overbuilt, one of those networks largely will be written off eventually, mm -hmm. and that's going to be wasted money. And again, you know, this is a timing issue, which is part of why we're delighted. We have very little uh, overbill with alternates, very, very little. Um, but, you know, partnering with Zen and others will mean that uh, there's a much higher chance that our network will be the one that will win out over the alternates, other alternates who might have got minor overbill with us who don't have uh, wholesale partnerships. So we can really start to see the win-win in this relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And my last question is, is about your plans for your retail ISP, because I know that you've recently restructured and you, you, you're carving off the retail ISP into a separate limited company. Um, what's the end state? Uh, do you want to keep that retail business? Is that something that you're going to potentially look to sell off and focus just on wholesale and network build? What can you share? Well. Again, going back to history, like most of my answers so far, is the alternate started and uh, there was no wholesale partnerships, not really, um, and uh, very different to Europe where a different model exists. So we had no choice but to go down the vertically integrated route. Yeah? And, um, and then you've got into various phases which the priority was build and build it and then they will come. And then we've gone to another phase where it's like, hang on, let's get customers on the network, let's penetrate the network as much as possible got companies that have gone through that phase and have gone back building. I'm thinking of Hyperoptic in particular. Um, and some companies have been extremely successful in building their vertically integrated ISPs uh, to the extent that they probably are wondering if they will go down the national ISP partnership route. They might be saying, well, look, we've got really good at this um, and so on. 
I would say we're reasonably good at it, okay, we're trying to get better all the time, but we are adding a lot of customers to our network at the moment, yeah? So our ISP is adding a lot of customers and we can't lose those net ads, right? We have to keep that momentum going. So our working assumption right now is that we are keeping our vertically uh, integrated ISP. But in terms of onboarding partners, such as Zen and yourself, you need to know and feel comfortable that they're getting no unfair advantage whatsoever, which is why, again, we started the journey uh, a while ago of completely separating our retail division physically and so on. And this is a long journey, yeah? And uh, uh, other companies have been through this, such as BT when they did uh, OpenReach and, and other companies as well. So right now we are going on that journey to totally separate um, uh, the retail division from the wholesale division. Uh, but I would never say never. You know, the reality at the end of the day is a customer network uh, or customer base has a value, yeah? Um, as I think you've said in one of your other interviews, the reason why ISPs and Netcos uh, exist is because they are different skill sets. So whilst we have to keep it because we have to keep adding customer numbers to increase the penetration, I would never say never that if you know the right offer was there that we would uh, consider spinning it off, but that's, that's not something we're considering right now. But what you can be rest assured is we are splitting it so that there will be no unfair advantage whatsoever. Yeah, I, I, and look, just to say to any other ISP watching this, that was something that I was, I asked that question in our contract negotiations. You know, what about, is there a, potential that your wholesale business will give an unfair advantage to your retail business so we'll find it difficult to compete and look I can say very honestly I was 100% comfortable that that's not an issue um, so I'd certainly got comfortable with that look Andy that's been brilliant thank you very much for that brilliant insight into Truly and the industry and thank you very much for being our third infrastructure partner. I think I'm, that's worthy of another handshake. Thanks in both directions, Richard. <laughs> it's been a pleasure and I can't wait for the next stage. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks very much for watching. Hope you found that interesting. See you again next time.